Thanks, Lizzie. Uh, so I'm going to, it's a very broad topic and I'm going to choose just a, a few points to address because, um, because of the sake of time. So we have been discussing this, we are looking for an ideal concept of lung and diaphragmatic protection and for sure we are starting to have some references for the right amount to, of effort to avoid atrophy and at the same time to avoid inflammation of the diaphragm and ventilator induced lung injury. And looks like something that for me it's, um, it, it, I confess that is quite surprising is that looks like that the same thresholds for having ventilator induced lung injury, they, they work also for the diaphragm. So whenever you start to exceed the amount of uh, negative swings here to create a ventilator induced lung injury, you also have some thickening of the diaphragm with some inflammation. Um, and certainly PEEP has a role here because uh, we know, and uh, this I had the privilege to have Takeshi working with me for a long time and then uh, I saw so many examples of how much PEEP can influence the force of the diaphragm, but not only the force, but the ventilatory drive. And I'm going to show you some examples. So first, uh, uh, I would like just to go back to some points in COVID. Uh, everyone testified this kind of scenario. Pneumomediastinum was a nightmare for COVID because um, Typically, it now is proven that these patients, they have much more complications. So the prognosis of the patient is already much worse because you see this. And uh, certainly this patient is going to complicate if you go to the ventilator and you use positive pressure ventilator. It's well known that if you have a pneumomediastinum, positive pressure ventilation is going to be a risk factor and can evolve to these ones. Lots of papers have, this, that have shown that the incidence of pneumomediastinum is five times higher in COVID than ARDS. And then uh, for me, it was very intriguing because everyone was saying, oh, there is a special fragility in the parenchyma of COVID patients that is causing this. I completely disagree because I, I think during the COVID time I have done tons of recruiting maneuvers and I never got a pneumothorax, a single case of pneumothorax. So pneumomediastinum is something different. And in fact, it's a well-known phenomenon studied by Macklin a long time ago. Pneumomediastinum is uh, the end result of patient self-inflicted lung injury. There is no question about this. And uh, this uh, I, th I think in, in the old times when they studied pneumomediastinum I mean, and Peter Macklin was talking about uh, this fistula that happens in, in the bronchioalveolar sheet, this was, uh, this was very clear. And for me, it's also something that is very clear when we do experimental studies. This has to be a signal that this patient is doing too much effort. And uh, another, another kind of uh, evidence for this is found in this study. Look at this. This is the number of days from the start of the episode of acute lung injury and the occurrence of pneumomediastinum. And then in blue it's COVID patients, in yellow is common ARDS. As you can see, it's a late phenomenon. Why? Because it's not in the acute phase. It's when the patient is spontaneously breathing after getting awake. And it's, it's during the assisted phase of mechanical ventilation. And typically in ARDS, it occurs in the acute phase. And so why COVID is like this? Why we see so many cases of pneumomediastinum without intubation? And during intubation, we see much more during the assisted phase than in patients with ARDS. I think it's because they have a much higher ventilatory drive. And uh, there are few studies about this, but there are some, some of them, they are very interesting. First, uh, I like this graph because this is one of the graphs that uh, Martin Tobin was using to say that there is no patient self-inflicted lung injury. This is just an invention of. 
um, I, I think he was very sloppy in this editorial because uh, I, I personally feel a little bit offended that he doesn't think that there is enough evidence for patient self-inflicted lung injury. But anyway, he was explaining this to talk about silent hypoxia. What he was talking about is that, oh, this is data from normal patients and volunteers. It's how much you increase your ventilatory minute ventilation when the PO2 goes down. And there is a clear threshold in 60. So this is normal physiology that then you start to increase minute ventilation. And this is exactly the basis for which we say that uh, the PO2 is a very low stimulus for the ventilatory drive because the slope of this curve here is almost zero. Obviously, here, everyone knows that below 60, PO2 is a very strong stimulus. But above 60, people is used to think that there is zero stimulus. And then, uh, I, my point is that in COVID patients, the curve is much more like this, and in fact, is much more like this. So, in fact, COVID patients, they have a very strong drive driven also by PO2 values. And this is the one very interesting study done by the people in San Diego, where this is the, let's say, the curve expected for normals that they took from volunteers and all these dots. So the, the graph is flipped in, in relationship to the previous one. So you just flipped the X axis, okay? So, uh, the, so the, the, below this threshold, you should see whoom, a big increase in ventilatory drive and these dots, they represent normal people. And these black dots, they are patients with COVID. So they are much above normal values. And these are patients that were breathing room air and they are not intubated. So clearly all these patients, they have a very high ventilatory drive. And this is why some of them, they present pneumomediastinum. I, I have shown you this example, but I think for me it was a striking case of a patient in my ICU. FiO2 is 70%, pressure support, tidal volume of 400. And then we are going, let's measure the P.1. P.1 is 1.4. And now we are going to change the FiO2. You see, we are changing the FiO2. So the, the SpO2 went down from 94 to 90%. So 90% saturation. So it's considered something that we do every day in the ICU. And then takes five breaths because you have to replace the FRC, the volume of gas that is inside the FRC. And then boom, you start to have a double trigger. And then you started to see something else that for me is very interesting. You see signals of expiratory muscle activation because now you don't have an exponential shape, but you have this bump, which is contraction of the abdomen. Now the minute ventilation is increasing. Remember, we started with nine. Now we are at 12. Tidal volume is increasing. Oh, look at the activation of expiratory muscles, every breath. And then minute ventilation is 13 and P.1, 6.7. So in one minute, P.1 went from 1.5 to 6 point something. So this is how strong can be the, uh, the ventilatory drive excited by little difference in oxygen. And uh, so certainly, uh, I believe that uh, this could be one of the triggers to ventilator-induced lung injury. This is part of uh, the work of uh, Takeshi also and Kayo. And uh, in this case, the difference between this and this is 24 hours of, of spontaneous ventilation with 6 ml per kilogram. So I, this is why I feel offended that uh, Martin Tobin doesn't believe in patient self-inflicted lung injury. And something that we, I, I strongly believe is that this is also related to lung fibrosis. And uh, there is now people studying interstitial lung disease, they are getting there. And this is a very interesting case of a patient with lung fibrosis, which had diaphragmatic uh, paralyzation. So he, he had this diaphragm was not working. 
And look what happens, fibrosis develop in the lung that is working. Have you seen any interstitial lung disease that happen only in one lung? This is very nice. Huh? It's a proof of concept uh, for me that uh, interstitial lung disease is, is uh, let's say, it's a vicious circle between the primary insult and patient self-inflicted lung injury after the lung gets low compliance and then every breath is a new threat to the lung. So they cure interstitial lung disease with paralysis of the diaphragm. And, one, uh, uh, and we, we, we dig into this subject because one uh, staff of our, of our ICU, uh, Carlos Stofen, he started to do CT after uh, survival of ARDS, six months later, for instance, and he was measuring how much fibrosis these patients they had. As you can see, the fibrosis that you see in one month can be reabsorbed partially. And then uh, they, they correlated the amount of fibrosis with driving pressures and, uh, it and with levels of, in, uh, of uh, pro-collagen in the blood that you, it happened in the first week of mechanical ventilation. So, patient self-inflicted lung injury is causing inflammation, shown in the PET studies, and is causing fibrosis. And uh, you, you probably saw both in COVID patients. We all experience patients that they start very inflamed, very hypoxemic, and later on the problem is that they have very low compliance and fibrotic lungs. And we believe that it's related to this, right? So you have a high driving pressure that is partially caused by the muscle with a very high ventilatory drive and partially caused by the physician. And this is why I try as much as I can to low down the pressure support most of my patients, they finish using CPAP during assisted ventilation. And then I, I try to modulate the muscle pressure. Um, one of, we have been discussing how to track uh, the muscle pressure. I like very much to know the compliance of the patient, tracking each every day, because then I can monitor driving pressure. And this is true. It's interesting that uh, if you have a patient under pressure support, decreasing pressure support to zero is not the ideal solution for all patients. Some patients, they present a U-shaped curve. So there is a certain level of pressure support that minimizes the tidal volume because it's a combination of this amount of pressure that you put here, but also how comfortable the patient feels and how he reacts. So some patients, they have a U-shaped curve and I try to reach the minimum of this curve. So, and then we, we did this kind of uh, protocol in which we, we have a stepwise approach. The first one is trying to minimize uh, pressure support, but this does not mean that we go to CPAP in all patients because some patients, they do better with seven of pressure support. It's the lowest possible tidal volume. Then the second step is pH. Uh, we, we are going to talk a little bit about FiO2 we have discussed, and uh, we are going to talk a little bit about the pH, because this is a little bit controversial, because uh, when, I, when I started to say that I'm using bicarbonate to, 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 in, to modulate the ventilatory drive, some people, they were skeptical, because they believe that bicarbonate is not going to help you. But uh, I believe it does, and we have now some proof that it does. Um, so let's just understand how it works, the ventilatory drive, when you have a little bit of metabolic acidosis. Um, let's understand the metabolic hyper hyperbola. This hyperbola is, uh, is a curve that the patient is always on top of it if you keep constant the production of CO2. So for instance, uh, let's suppose that my patient at the baseline is here, and then I do a little bit of hyperventilation. So the patient is going to decrease the CO2, increase minute ventilation. So the production of CO2 is still the same. So let's suppose that now I'm doing permissive hypercapnia. So the patient is going to move there. So this is what we call the metabolic hyperbola, because it's the CO2 production that puts you in this curve. 
And then let's suppose that now you have increased that space, you have fever, you have sepsis, you are going to move to some curve here. Um, and then just because you have fever, if you, uh, if you want to stay with the same PCO2, you have to increase your minute ventilation, right? So this was controlled mechanical ventilation. What happens when, uh, because you are, you are trying to keep the same PCO2, but what, what happens when you are under assisted ventilation? Then it's a little bit different. Um, for instance, let's test the response to this patient to an increased dead space. For instance, adding an HMA. Okay, so I'm increasing the dead space. So what is going to happen is that each patient is going to move in this direction in a very peculiar way. And this is the PCO2 ventilation response. And uh, this is slope is going to define the response of this patient and more or less his ventilatory drive. And I ask you to read this review that uh, Leon, Leo was responsible for this uh, review, this review article and where they have this very complicated graph, but I'm going to just choose two lines that for me, they are very important. So this is what we have been discussing. So it's the response of this patient to a dead space, for instance. But what happens if this patient has hypoxia, like the COVID patients, he's going to move to this direction. As to, 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 to the left, sorry, one second. So the patient was, so he's going to move to this next curve here. So what, what, what this represents is that with this curve, the slope is higher. So the minute ventilation for each increment of CO2 is going to be higher. And if the patient has metabolic acidosis, look at this curve, should be here. And this is exactly what happens if my patient has a low pH caused by metabolic acidosis like renal failure. Which means that in practice, if my patient uh, has acidosis and a little bit of hypoxia, his minute ventilation is going to be four times, it's going to be to the sky. It's going, so first it's going to be here because of hypoxia and then to keep the same PCO2, now, PCO2, now with acidosis, he's going to be here. And then if you have sepsis, now you can go to the sky. Okay, so, and I think uh, we have seen many patients like this, right? So, uh, and then when we do this protective bundle that we try to do a stepwise approach, I think, um, this is an important component and I, I can tell you that for, for most patients, this was responsible for controlling the ventilatory drive within the good range in about 30% of the patients and FiO2 in about other 30% of the patients or 30 to 20% of the patients. This one didn't work. Why? Because I was using already ideal PEEP. So I, uh, and this was a learning process. Uh, I was imagined that every time that we increase PEEP, we decrease the ventilatory drive. This is not true if you are already in the right PEEP. So if you are at low PEEP, for instance, five or 10, then if you optimize PEEP, you are going to decrease the ventilatory drive. But if you are already optimizing PEEP according to esophageal balloon or according to EIT, it's not going to work. So then th what this, <laughs> represents is that in about 40 to 50 percent of the patients we had to do partial paralysis. I don't have time now to discuss about this, but uh, this is my message. Thank you very much.